Um, so I am Michael Pilot. I am the Production Engineering Lead for Braintree. Um, I'm gonna talk about routing and load balancing at Braintree, and in particular, uh, we do something a little crazy, why we build our own routers and load balancers uh, from off-the-shelf hardware and open source software. Um, so quickly about me, I joined Braintree in 2011, uh, and as a developer, but pretty quickly moved to infrastructure work, um, and kind of never left that group. Uh, and now I work with a group of engineers that's responsible for ensuring the uptime and performance of the Braintree platform. Uh, before that, I was at Wolfram Research for a long time, uh, worked on Mathematica features and Wolfram Alpha when that launched. So I've been kind of all over the place as a developer, admin, database engineer. So um, I like uptime. Uh, to understand why I like uptime so much, I'm going to give you a quick background on, on Braintree and what we do. Um, so Braintree powers online and mobile e-commerce. You know, put simply, we're behind the scenes powering the payment experience for big companies and small companies from the hottest startups to the mom and pop web stores. Uh, we give them APIs to accept payments, credit cards, PayPal, Bitcoin, Apple Pay, Venmo, um, more coming in the pipe. Um, and while we're not a household name, you've probably heard of some of our merchants. Um, we power payments for Airbnb, Uber, GitHub, Twilio, um, PagerDuty, our favorite. Um, so, you know, stores big and big and small, uh, and so as these, as, these, as these merchants grow, we've been growing pretty qu pretty quickly too. Um, and actually, last year we announced that we just hit fifty billion dollars in annualized authorized processing volume. Important footnote. Um, so that's quite a bit of money. If you saw Lionel's talk yesterday, he put it at ninety five thousand dollars a minute on average through our platform. Uh, so a little bit more about Braintree and our history. Uh, we were founded in 2007, uh, and we were actually bootstrapped and profitable that entire time. Um, we didn't take any funding until 2011. We took $34 million in Series A, a Series B the year after that, and then we were acquired by PayPal for $800 million uh, in 2013. Uh, and then just this year, two months ago, we split out from eBay and are now just part of PayPal, uh, which is a separate public company again. Um, and so given that background now, let's think about why we build our own routers and load balancers. Um, so, you know, first of all, what do we have as a company? Uh, we have amazing engineers. I work with some really smart people who understand Linux frighteningly well. Um, you know, and frankly, our routing and LB requirements are pretty simple. Um, and I think most importantly, we're really passionate about open source software in that community. Our client libraries are open source. We open source the technology that we build and we try to give back to the community with patches uh, and that kind of stuff, and, and have events that support open source software. So what don't we have? Uh, we don't have an NetEng team, believe it or not. We don't have any CCNAs. Uh, I'm not trying to disparage those certifications, they're great. Uh, my point is that we don't have in-house vendor expertise. We could develop it, of course, but it hasn't been a priority. Uh, and it should be clear that with the volume of dollars flowing through our stack at all times, uh, downtime costs us a lot of money. And uh, not only for us, but it also costs our merchants money, because when we're down, they don't make any money either. Uh, and someone trying to check out on a mobile app is not going to come back 10 minutes later and figure out what happened. Um, so given this background, um, you know, we have pretty simple requirements for routing. So what are those requirements? Uh, first is BGP. We ingress and egress traffic at our edge to our endpoints through BGP. We have a prefix that we advertise through several ISPs. Uh, and this gives us some advantages. Um, flexible routing for DDoS mitigation, for example, failover, active active data centers. This is all really valuable. Um, and actually, BGP routes update faster, usually, than DNS. Um, people like to ignore DNS caches. They like to, you know, and TTLs. That can be pretty annoying. Um, so this has been a pretty good solution for us. Um, the next requirement is OSPF. Um, pretty simple requirement here. <laughs> we use OSPF to get traffic from one site to a different data center site. Uh, we have some piper backhaul, and we back it up um, as well. So we have an OSPF network that spans both DCs uh, to do that routing for us. Uh, third requirement is IPSEC. Pretty simple again. Uh, we mostly use this on the routing level for site-to-site -site tunnels to back up that fiber. Um, and we also use IPSEC other places in our stack for third-party connectivity. Um, final requirement for routing is NAT. No surprise. Um, we outbound NAT to the internet, and we inbound NAT to certain things, not for public services, but for other, other tools and, and, and such. Um, 
and talking LBs, those are even simpler requirements. Basically, I have one requirement. Get packets somewhere. Um, so if you watched Lionel's talk yesterday, you know we push a lot of this complexity down in the stack. SSL termination, request inspection, rate limiting. Um, we just haven't had a need to do it at the load balancing level yet. Um, so given that, what does this stack actually look like? So this is kind of our data center stack at the top level. A couple of ISPs, got some routers, and uh, below that we have load balancers. Um, one of the, we have uh, three load balancers, for example, here. Uh, any one of those LBs is serving all of the connections for a particular IP. Um, and I should note as well that any of these routers, any, either of the routers and any of the one LBs can serve all the traffic for the data center. Um, we have more than one for just for resiliency. Uh, and then put together into a data center picture, um, here's that OSPF network that ties the two DCs together and blow up the, the LB clusters. Uh, so. So now the fun part, how do we actually do this? Um, the biggest tool we use right now is Bird. Uh, it's an open source routing daemon, provides support for other protocols, but we only use it for BGP and OSPF routing. Um, so we put configs on disk, um, Bird can load them, obviously, and then uh, set up uh, the route tables that we need in, uh, in the kernel to do our routing. Uh, we use this both internally for eBGP and not internally for other BGP networks that we run inside the data center as well. Um, nope, and this slide broke, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> so net filter is the other big thing, uh, you know, firewalling with IP tables, IP set. Uh, connection tracking, we use contract tools, and I'll describe that in a little bit, a little bit more in a minute, and that's my speaker notes there, but... Um, uh, we turn a bunch of kind of... Um, Configuration files that we've kind of brewed, brewed in house into IP tables rules and other configuration. Uh, we actually drive that out through Puppet today to control the load balancers. Uh, and the sort of the core of L the LB is IPVS. So this is uh, uh, IPVS is the core of our load balancing. So uh, IPVS is a transport layer load balancer in the Linux kernel. Um, it basically forwards packets that come in to uh, the healthiest available backend. Uh, there's a few ways of doing this. The most common that we use is weighted least connections and weighted round robin. Um, and there are some tools that we use to monitor the health of the backends that I'll describe in a minute as well. Um, so when a load balance, when a packet destined for a load balanced IP arrives on the input side of IP tables, our favorite diagram, uh, we mark it in the, in the table with something called a forward mark. Uh, you can think of this like a hashtag for your packet. Uh, it kind of carries along with the packet as it flows through the routing table. Uh, IPVS routes uh, the packet to a group of backends based on that forward mark. It doesn't actually look at the IP anymore after that point. Um, so when it's decided where to put the, where to send, which backend to send the packet to uh, in the post routing, it actually is going to wrap that original IP packet with a new IP packet. So we're going to IP, IP encapsulate and then send it on to the backend with a new IP wrapper. Um, yeah, and again, the LB is also using the filter, so IP tables, IP set, and contract tools. And I'll describe contract in a few minutes. Uh, yeah, so IP, IPVS and uh, IP tables kind of go hand in hand to make this load balancing work. Um, so, what do we actually monitor the backends with? This is a daemon we wrote called Big Brother runs on, on each load balancer for a particular service and monitors the backends of that service. Uh, so it's, every, it's reaching out every two seconds to that backend and saying, how healthy are you? Are you okay? Are you alive? Uh, and makes just a simple HTTP request to do that. Uh, if it doesn't get a response within two seconds, it assumes the backend is down or dead and it pulls it out of the cluster. Uh, this is an open source tool. You can go find that on GitHub if you want to look at it. Um, just makes that call to the backend service and updates the weights in IPVS. Uh, sorry, IPVS is IP Virtual Server. It's the um, it's a Linux project that does layer four load balancing in the kernel. So going back to this diagram, um, Big Brother monitors backends and updates the health of each of the backends that it's going to balance across in Big Brother or in IPVS rather. Sorry. Um, I don't think so. No. Uh, the counterpoint to this is litmus paper, litmus paper sorry. 
Uh, this is what Big Brother pulls on the back end to retrieve the health from that back end. Um, this is a little daemon that runs, it's a little Ruby, Ruby daemon, and it reports its health via an HTTP service. Um, so it gives a, it delivers a little DSL on a toolbox on the back end for health checks. Pretty simple. Uh, and then when the Big Brother calls into it, it reports its aggregate health as, an, as a back end. Um, usually it could be do zero to 100, 100 being fully healthy, zero being I'm down, or don't ignore me, you know, whatever. Uh, this is also open source, you can find that on GitHub. Um, Another nice feature of this is we can actually use this to do maintenance on a backend. We can force the weight to be zero, uh, and then the LB will stop sending requests to that node. Um, the nice thing about this is that actually IPVS will finish routing connections that are already established to that backend and won't sever them immediately. So we can force a node down, let the connections drain out, and then gracefully shut it down without affecting any connect connections. Sorry? Uh, it's a Ruby, Ruby DSL. Ruby, yeah, that's pretty simple. Um, some things you can check in the DSL, uh, CPU load, memory usage, uh, contents of a particular file, if that's something that matters for your application. Uh, something we actually do pretty often is, is some other service that's around available. Um, so we'll actually go out and check a different service, see if it's there, and if that's down, then my app can't function, so I'm gonna say I'm down too. Um, so we can kind of have this sort of self-healing network uh, we also have stuff for HA proxy if we because we do some proxying with HA proxy as well, and you can actually customize it with other scripts and checks if you want to do that. Uh, so developers can actually easily add their own metrics to this tool. Uh, a new addition to the stack, and if you watched Lionel's talk yesterday, you learned that we actually haven't touched this in almost five years, and that's not entirely true. Uh, we, we've most recently added uh, what we call Interpol. Uh, this gives us some really cool active, active load balancing features. So. Um, Interpol sits in each DC and actually aggregates the weights of the services in that data center. It then reports that back to the other data center and says, hey, I'm an I'm a app A node, kind of. It kind of fakes it. And uh, so we can use IPVS to then actually route requests to that other data center over our OSPF backhaul. So IPVS only sees this Interpol backend as another just, yeah, another app server for me to use. But actually what's happening is the traffic is coming into the one LB, getting sent to the other data center, and then being load balanced again across those other DC's nodes. Uh, we have some magic in the way in there to make sure that requests don't come back to the first DC again, so that would be undesirable. So I could just keep popping back and forth between the two DC's. Uh, this is not open source yet, but it might be in the future. We haven't decided what we're gonna do with this yet, so. Um, our bread and butter is Debian Wheezy. So uh, with the asterisk, we use a 316 three kernel now. Uh, from backports, and I'll kind of describe what we're running a newer kernel in a bit. Um, so, you know, that's sort of the software stack, and of course, there's hardware for this stuff too. Um, so I'll kind of overview the hardware we use and a few tips we've, we've found if you decide to join our little asylum here. Uh, so the first-gen router hardware looks kind of like this. It's a super, super micro 1U chassis. It's got a couple of processors in it, you know, 8 to 12 cores, depending on when we put them in place. Uh, and they have the Intel 5000 series NICs. I forget the exact model number of those, but um, so we're doing one and some 10 gig with that. Going forward now, we have our second gen routers. Um, these are a Dell 2U chassis, a bigger chassis, so we can put more NICs in the back of it, basically. Um, uh, you know, more cores, faster processor, and now we're going to 40 gig uh, and fiber. Um, so one of the reasons we need to use the newer kernel is that these Intel NICs actually have a driver that's only available in like the latest kernels. Uh, it's actually a 40 gig chip on both cards. So it's a pretty new driver. Uh, and I can tell you from experience that backporting drivers into older kernels is not my favorite way to spend a Friday. So uh, the LB hardware is similar, but a little less powerful because we're not pushing as many packets through the LB layer as we are through the routing stack. So we can get with a little less here. Uh, the first gen here is a Supermicro 1U pizza box, literally about this big. Um, it's got a core two, pretty slow nowadays, um, but does the job. Uh, the same Intel 5000 series NICs. Uh, second gen gets more powerful. Again, this is a 1U Dell, uh, dual core Xeon, and um, the 10 gig uh, copper Intel NICs. So if you're gonna build these yourself, there's a couple things you should think about at least we've found over the years. Um, one thing that's pretty nice to have 
is AES-NI. This is basically doing AES offload on the processor instead of in user space. So um, this is most important for IPSEC where you're gonna get faster tunnel speeds, basically. I'm pretty sure all processors have this now, but uh, just don't go build a router with a Celeron or something. Um, if you're like me, you haven't thought about IRQs much since you put a sound blaster in your computer to play Doom. Uh, it's actually pretty easy to max out interrupts on a single core by serving NIC traffic. Um, so one thing you, can, you wanna look for is cards that support MSI or MSIX. Uh, this takes that single hardware pin interrupt and uses instead message signaling actually on the data bus of, of the PCI bus. So this allows multiple cores to service interrupts for the same NIC at the same time. Uh, you wanna kinda of pair this with something like IRQ balance, which actually distributes those IRQ assignments across multiple cores evenly and will rebalance them over time based on utilization. Uh, and I can tell you from my experience as well, you should monitor that utilization of case after IRQ because that's what's actually processing your NIC interrupts on these boxes. Um, so if you're doing that too much, uh, you have some latency problems. So and, you know, by letting all these multiple cores service interrupts, you get much better throughput and latency. Um, so as I said before, we have no tolerance for downtime. Uh, we wanna make sure that these services don't ever go down. So how do we do that? Uh, the tool we lean on most there is Pacemaker. As Lionel mentioned yesterday in his talk, we use it quite a bit. Um, so I'm gonna kind of talk through how it works and give a few examples of how we leverage it in these, in these uh, systems. Um, so Pacemaker has three main parts. There's kind of the non-cluster components. These are the resources themselves that run, like IPs. Uh, the scripts that move things, that control things. Uh, the second piece is resource management. This is the brain that kind of decides what happens in the cluster. And the third piece is like, how do we actually make the cluster, have it be correlate, how does it talk to the other, other nodes? Um, so I'm gonna define a little vocabulary here first before we go to the diagram, because there's a lot of stuff happening here. Uh, LRM is like the local resource manager. This is what controls um, things that happen on a particular node. CRM is what transmits instructions to other nodes. Uh, the policy engine decides what's gonna happen in the cluster. The CIB is a database of cluster information. Stoneth is how we do fencing, which I'll describe in a minute too. Uh, and then CoreSync is the actual underlying kind of core eight system that's below this. Um, so the cluster actually elects a domain controller to be the sort of the, the leader of the cluster. Um, so what happens is the, uh, so CIB is storing information in the cluster Sorry, my notes are on the wrong page. <laughs> CIB stores information about the cluster. That information is fed to the policy engine. The engine decides to act on that information if it wants to. Those actions are passed to the domain controller. The domain controller feeds those to the local node or to CRM to go to other nodes. Uh, that looks kind of like this. So you can kind of see in this diagram that Corosync is kind of the, the, the bedrock of this thing. So what kind of makes that tick? So CoreSync is the totem single ring ordering and membership protocol for virtual ex extended virtual synchrony. That's a lot of words. What you need to know is it's basically UDP multicast. Uh, so you get reliable ordered message delivery and um, there's one speaker at a time. So this is like the Lord of the Flies, I have the conch thing. Um, so it's actually passing a totem around the ring of, of nodes and that whoever has the totem gets to sort of send messages out at that time. There's a pretty interesting paper about this. Um, However, my favorite feature of the system is actually Stoneth. Um, and I get to use one of my favorite GIFs. So this is Stoneth. Uh, it stands for shoot the other node in the head. <laughs> um, so we use this to actually implement fencing of naughty clusters, cluster members rather. Uh, so when the cluster decides to take an action and a node ignores or improperly acts on the messages, the cluster will, will literally reboot the, the offending node, like, like that. Uh, we do this by sending an SNMP message to the PDUs in the racks and literally turn off the power and turn it back on. Uh, for those that don't know, a PDU is basically a thousand dollar power strip with SSH. So, um, so on the load balancers of the primary resource management pacemaker are things we call HA services, colloquially they at Braintree anyway. Uh, each service is a group of two resources, a virtual IP and config to manage Big Brother. Pretty simple. Uh, when a service moves to a new load balancer, pacemaker removes the IP and stops Big Brother on the old node. Then it adds the IP to the new node and starts Big Brother on the new node to start monitoring those backends for that service. It then does finally a gratuitous ARP to say, hey, that IP you want so dearly is now over here to get all the backend nodes that want to talk to that thing and the front end nodes of the routers to go to the new MAC address for that IP. Uh, you know, 
And uh, also important is that pacemaker actually monitors the nodes that aren't running a service to make sure that it is in fact not running there. Uh, and when that does happen, that's where you also get the, the face punch to happen there. So. Uh, on the routers, one important resource manager of pacemaker is the um, is NAT. So one of the two routers is actually doing all the NATing for the for the data center. So the active NAT router broadcasts um, the state about all its connections to the other router, and we do this because when something goes wrong, you get page and you scream. Um, Pacemaker will fail over to the other router, load that NAT table into the kernel, and then it will resume all the connections that were already open. So we actually don't lose connections when we have a router failover. We do this for both inbound and outbound NAT. Uh, so when we do this on the load balancers as well, with, uh, this is all with the contract tools. Uh, as a daemon running it, this is all a multicast uh, broadcast of these um, connection states. The nice thing with the LBs is that when there's a problem, um, the cluster will move the VIP to a new LB, but the state's already there and loaded and running, so the connection just keeps on going. Uh, so one of the key things about IPVS is that we actually rely on the uh, retry semantics of TCP to save our butts when things go wrong, because uh, TCP will back off and retry, while we move IPs around, and ARP, and all that other fun stuff that we have to do. Uh, so that's a few examples of how we build a cluster of routers and load balancers, and I'm gonna talk about kind of what we've learned after doing this for five years. Uh, so what are the advantages of doing this? It's kind of crazy. Um, it's Linux. We all know Linux. You can monitor it with tools. We, Nagios, Graphite, whatever your poison of choice is. Um, you can manage it pretty well with Puppet, Chef, Ansible, again, whatever you like to use. D-Shell, I don't know. Uh, and it's, you know, already know how to troubleshoot Linux. You know where to look when there's something going wrong for the most part. Um, with some of those little foibles I mentioned before. Um, we can build the failure semantics that we actually want. You know, um, we don't lose connections in flight when things fail. We can build a high availability store, high availability store that we need as a company. Mm -hmm. And uh, maintenance operations are easy to do without any downtime. Um, we haven't taken a, a downtime in, on purpose in years. So. <laughs> uh, one other fun fact, you can actually virtualize your router since that's just Debian. Um, if you want to test a package upgrade, you can spin up a virtual cluster. If you want to play with the pacemaker clustering software itself, you can virtualize it, play with all that. Um, obviously, you can't have real, you can't do all the same real Nick stuff, but you can play with the software around the router itself pretty easily. We actually also do this to spin up uh, kind of out-of-band networks for monitoring and management that go from side to side as well with different OSPF networks. Actually works really well. So again, we kind of cut to fit, you know. Great uptime, I think our record uptime for a router is over 500 days, which is pretty impressive, I think. Uh, you can design the exact runtime and failure that you want to use, and uh, you kind of get total flexibility in routing and load balancing. Uh, so what are the challenges with this? With this? Hello. Um, I think the biggest challenge with this is we are the support model. You know, we don't have a, someone we can call on the phone and say, hey, your thing broke, how do we fix it? Um, we're doing that work. You know, we've, we've found kernel bugs, driver bugs, um, all this kind of stuff. So again, you need kind of newer kernels for some of the driver support for some of the newer hardware. Uh, we found older kernels have some bugs. I think one recent one was in doing that active active interpol work, we actually found a place in IPVS where they used a malloc instead of a zalloc. And so we were losing packets because the struct was referencing uninitialized memory, which was kind of fun. So. Uh, we had some problems with LRO and GRO. This was large receive offload and generic receive offload on the NICs. Um, we haven't really gotten to the bottom of why this is a problem. We just sort of turn it off as we find these issues. Uh, the, other, the other challenge with this is that a lot of the docs for some of these tools, pacemaker is okay, core sync, not so much, net filter, very much not so. Uh, docs are pretty poor. So you have to do some source code splunking and a lot of playing around to figure out some deeper things sometimes. Another challenge for us is a, as a company that moves money and credit cards, um, compliance, actually. So there's a thing called PCI, which is the Payment Card Industries Data Security Standard. Um, this kind of describes how you have to handle credit card information, how you store it, how you um, encrypt it, that kind of stuff. Uh, similarly, SSA 16, some of you may know as an audit. Um, since we're a public company, we have to do SOX auditing now. Um, and you know, building your own router isn't forbidden by these things, but 
I have a lot of problems explaining to an auditor like that IP tables is actually a firewall and not just, an, it's not an appliance, it's a, it's a software that is a firewall. Um, so, uh, that's been, it's not a challenge, I guess it's a challenge, but it, it's one we can overcome with enough explanation. But it's not a box like this is a, you know, Palo Alto on, on some checklist that they have, so. Um, so what we're gonna do in the future with this, I think one thing we can talk about is IPv6 support. Uh, actually, most of the components we use for this, the obviously the NICs, but the you know, bird itself, IP tables, supports IP6. So that's good. Uh, other parts of our stack don't, so it's not really worth doing for us yet. Um, I think the other important argument here is like buy versus build. Um, initially, when Braintree was very small, we were bootstrapped, money was not, you know, non-existent, but it, you know, Money had to be spent very carefully. Uh, and so it actually made a lot of sense to build these routers, build these LBs, because they're not that expensive, they work really well. Uh, we've had really good results with them. Um, I think now, you know, frankly, we can spend money if we need to. Um, and so the cost of engineering time and opportunity is now possibly greater than the cost of something like a fully off-the-shelf appliance. Um, and as we continue to grow, the complexity of these things is probably gonna exceed the DIY capability of us. Um, and you need more kind of crazier hardware once you're talking about 40 gig, 100 gig, that kind of stuff. Um, so those are kind of our two big arguments right now, I think, as a company. Um, and that's all I really had. Um, I'm actually, this is a sponsored talk, but I'm actually not here to sell you a product, I'm here to sell you on Braintree. Uh, if, you, if this sounds like something you wanna work on and it's fun, uh, you should come talk to me or talk to Dave or anybody here from Braintree, we'd love to talk to you. Um, there's some swag on the front, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions. I went through this pretty fast, I apologize. So, yeah. Um, not really, no. So the, the policy engine here is not like policy you're applying to requests. It's policy, it's, 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 the, it's the engine that enforces the policy of that pacemaker system. So it's saying like, I want this thing to run here, I'm gonna make that happen. Um, so it's, yeah, it's not like, an, like a configuration for the actual load balancing. Um, you know, we're not looking at the request at all. We're just saying, here's a packet for this IP, where does it go on which back end? And so, the LB is actually not looking inside the packet at all. It's just looking at source and destination. Um, so, yeah. How do you handle uh, software upgrades in light of the fact that you've got uh, data replicating from a primary to the constant backup? Uh, is there any issue with the data format there, or can you just like, bring up the new version on the hot backup failover and then bring up the new again on the other one? Uh, that's a good question. So the question was, how do we do, um, maintenance when there's this kind of replication of state going on between routers, between load balancers, right? That was the question? Yeah. Yep. Um, so, for most maintenance, we're actually not like shutting down the node. We might stand it by in, in, in the cluster and that will actually move the services off of it, but the state is still happening to upgrade a package to do make some other kind of configuration change. Um, in the case that we have to do like a complete shutdown, uh, I'm actually not, positive what happens, to be honest. Um, if Mike's here, he might know. <laughs> but, uh, like, Yeah, so there's a, there's a brief window where I think there is some risk there, but um, the contract daemon actually is broadcasting state like all the time. It's not like I have a new connection and it never, never describes it. It's like it's still every time you get an update for it, I think it's sending out. Yeah, we actually have Nagios checks around that, make sure that the two tables are in sync on the routers or the, um, uh, the three LBs, for example. So you actually can do that. Um, 
just the time to upgrade our entire fleet. I think. Um, Yeah, and just the opportunity cost of that versus other work we have to go do right now. Um, oh, the, the <laughs> yeah. Debian's still stable, right? It's old stable now, but uh, or easiest old stable, but it's still stable. Um, but we are we are we are deploying Jesse in some places now, so um, it's just it's work we have to go do to actually upgrade the entire fleet of, of servers, um, and we tend to run the most stable thing possible at the top of the stack just because of its importance in the in the stack. Yes. How do you as a company That's a good question. I think so. The question: How do we track the value of kind of this, you know, builder on routers approach versus like the, uh, you know, the cost of buying a Cisco, buying something else? Um, I think right now the biggest way we track it is like, what is the actual impact to production? How many outages are caused by router failure, a load balancer failure, a bug in the software? Um, and I think right now we spend, you know, not that much time touching these things that would make sense to go spend the money on the hardware, spend the money learning about the hardware, or bringing in someone to help with the hardware, building a team to manage it, whatever it would be. Um, but we think that's the thing we can evaluate frequently, right? So we can, I have my list of outages, and here's what caused them. And if it's the router has been causing problems for two years, we'd probably look at that again. So I think uptime drives a lot of our choices um, right now. Unlike any company, we've, we've had bad experiences with vendors, we have good experiences with vendors too. So I think we're not shy of that. We're just, you know, this has worked for a long time and we're just not in a place where we have to touch it right now. So, um, you know, given the team that we have and the, the massive growth that we're always under, we've doubled year over year for the last you know, 10 years. Um, <laughs> where we spend our time is important and, uh, you know, like, like Mike said, if it's not broke, we're not gonna fix it right now, so. Get some swag, come get some socks. Nice.